well, if the lead actress is puking cats, <laughs> what I cannot do with lighting, right? I shot the whole scene with coverage and everything in an hour. In one hour? <laughs> wow. What you see in the friend of the family, you feel the period, the 70s. But it's how I remember my childhood. He said that they will not approve me because they needed an alpha male DOP. <laughs> We're not sure if I could deal with a male team. And I'm like, so what you think I've been doing for 25 years, working with all girls? He told me and he said, Sally, I want this project to be the best work I ever done. And when they finished the nine episode in the United States was last week, I wrote him a message and I said, we did it. Is this the best work that you ever done? And he said, yes, but thanks to you. Hey everyone, welcome to the first ever episode of The Moving Image. This is your host, Poncho Navarro, and today we have an amazing, amazing conversation with Celiana Cárdenas, AMC. She's actually considered to be the first ever Mexican female cinematographer, although there have been women in the past that have shot films. Uh, sadly, they couldn't have... Uh, they didn't have the opportunity to build a career um, out of that as illustrious and extensive as Celiana's. And she's actually the first ever female to graduate as a cinematographer from Mexico's top film school, the CCC, or the, the Film Training Center for its Spanish uh, acronym. And she's not only an amazing cinematographer, but she's, she's a professional sailor. She races cars. She is, she's a badass in all the extent of that word. And uh, we didn't talk about this uh, during the podcast, during the interview, but her career, obviously being the first ever woman doing it in Mexico, she had no one to look up to. And she quite literally had to pave her own way through all the misogyny and all the, the discrimination in the Mexican film industry back in the 90s, early 2000s. And... She quite literally paved the way for a new generation of women in Mexico uh, to become cinematographers or to be filmmakers in general. So I find that quite amazing, really. And I, have, I am so grateful to have had the privilege to talk to her, to have a two-hour conversation uh, and to break down some of her work of her new show, A Friend of the Family, which is an amazing show and you, should, uh, you shouldn't miss it. So without further ado, Celiana Cárdenas, AMC. All right, welcome to this first episode of The Moving Image. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Celiana Cárdenas, AMC, to the studio. Thank you, Celiana, for being here with me. Thank you for inviting me. I'm just going to jump into it. Um, tell me about your path to cinematography. I know you went to film school, but I just want to know how you got in, how the steps you took to get into being a cinematographer? Um, okay, so, well, yes, I started in Mexico City. I'm from Mexico City. And um, around the second year, I start working as a camera assistant. And for my surprise, which I wasn't expecting, I was the only camera assistant, female camera assistant in that moment in Mexico which make very difficult for me to work because the union didn't accept me for being a woman. So it was very uh, hard for me to find work in the professional area because for the producers to be able to hire me, they have to pay um, in the union the other AC that will not come and take my place. So they have to, you know, pay, pay double. Yeah. So... That it was difficult, but at the same time, because of the school, I started working, I did uh, two feature films, and as a AC, as a second AC at that time, and with no payment, no nothing, just, you know, to start doing it. And then, thanks to some of the directors of photography of Mexico at that time, Carlos Markovic, for example, I was his camera assistant for a long time. Uh, I mean, long time, like two years or something like that. But I also um, was a camera assistant of Javier Pérez Grobet, Jorge Medina, Rodrigo Prieto, 
a Emanuel Lubezki. So thanks to them, I was able to work, okay? I work in commercials. I uh, I did documentaries as a as an AC, and then as the time went by, um, in 1990, I do my first uh, professional film as a second. The DP was Rodrigo Garcia, which is a very good friend of mine, but he's also the son of Garcia Marquez, and we did Danson, Maria Novaro's film. And thanks to uh, the producer, he was allowed, you know, he was okay paying double or twice. And I was able to do that movie. So that was my first credit as a professional work in camera department. This was in 1990. When we finished that film, then uh, I came with a surprise. Like I said, that we, I couldn't work more. Many producers will know wanted to do uh, the pain twice for me. So came a TV series in Mexico. There was non-union and the DP was Alex Phillips. And the first day she said, well, Sally, why do you think if you come, you know, it's, it's going to be a series. It's eight months in Puerto Vallarta. It's American, Canadian and Mexican. Okay. So I go there, shot in super 16 millimeters. So Alex Phillips was uh, a Mexican DOP. Uh, his father was a very important DOP in the golden era of film, uh, Mexican cinema. And, but he also was an ASC. So we go to Vallarta, right? And um, for my surprise, uh, probably around, we were eight months there, for 22 episodes, around the third month, let's say, around there, Alex Phillips didn't show up on a Monday to work. And, you know, we have calls at 6 a.m. We have to travel to Buceria. At that time, it was all like a dirty road. So we make an hour and a half to get to Buceria at that time. And it was no time to bring another DP. They were bringing actors from Australia, England, United States, Canada, etc. So the producers, of course, came to the camera truck and they asked, right? And they said, well, you know, guys, we're, we're in, in trouble. We, you know, uh, we don't have a DP. What happened to him? Um, he parried a little bit too much. Right. And, um, and at that time as, uh, you know, between alcohol and other substances. Right. Um, he had a problem, and so he was in the hospital. Wow. So the producer come, and the Mexican producer, and the team in the camera department was camera operators and steady cam were Canadians. And first ACs and second ACs, which were, we were the loaders and the um, slates. Mm -hmm. We were Mexicans, plus the gaffer, key grip, and all the all the electrics and, and grip uh, team. But, so, um, uh, it, the producer obviously goes to the operators, which are the second in command, and then it's like, well, guys, did you, like, no. <laughs> you know, I operate the camera, I don't DP, no. They, he went to the, um, to the, the first. first, and and at that moment, I'm in the dark room, which, is a place where in when you work with film, we have a truck and it has a room where you load and unload the magazines. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the, in the room loading magazines and I come out and I say, me, right? I'll do it. I do it. And it's like, what? <laughs> like you are the last one of the ACs. And I'm like, I know, but I'm the only one that is going to be a DP. And this is in my third year of film school. And... They were like, well, uh, and I said, well, I have all the lighting um, diagrams of Alex. I can do it. And I think they were so desperate <laughs> and they, they were okay. And then the gaffer and the key grip, they called me Pitufina. I don't know the name in English. It's more fit, I think. It's right. more fit. Yeah. Because I was the only one in all the Pitufos, right? Right. <laughs> so they called me all, they all called me Pitufina. So it's like, okay, Pitufina, let's go, let's do it, let's do it, right? So the gaffers and everything, they support me and 
I did it. And we used to send the, the material to United States to photochem, get the rushes, and then, you know, CBS will watch them. And they never felt there was no Alex Phillips. <laughs> so that was very good. Wow. And then Alex Phillips saw my material and he's like, why are you doing as my second AC? And I'm like, well, you know, so that's how I start, right? And say, no, no, no. From now on, I'm going to give you the second unit and you're going to operate my camera. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so from that, I started dipping in the series. And thanks to that, the series came to a second year in Israel. And by that time, CES hired me as the second unit DP. So I went to Israel. And the good thing about my school is um, because we were only two DPs in the generation. In the generation, we were only 12 people, 12 students for generation. Um, so I really have the opportunity to be able to work because, of course, they were not teachers that we will be teaching to, uh, to, two, people, know, yeah. two people. And I was the only one that was not directing. The other DP, Federico Barbabosa, he was directing also. So uh, for me was to go and learn outside, but I have the privilege to come back and then shoot the shorts of my... my for sure, was you were of the course, only option for them too. <laughs> right? So, which it was great. So I could leave and then come back and shoot and at school. So that show... It really uh, make me, you know, start, you know, feeling what was to to do or to be a DP in the professional world. Right. But I married the lead actor of the series. <laughs> <laughs> I married the lead actor of the series, and that it changed my course. Um, I finished the school, I graduate, and then uh, we live in LA for seven years. And in, uh, in L.A., I did a master's um, in UCLA. It was called uh, Painting with Light. Mm -hmm. And I did my master's there. And I have the opportunity, of course, as you can imagine, at that time also we were like three women DP, I think, something like that. And um, I did my first feature film when I was in 1995, so I was 28. Wow. I'm even embarrassed to say it, but it was a laundry money film. A lawyer, they need to put some money into <laughs> something. And I was like, I shoot it. I no don't worries. care. No questions asked. No questions asked. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Wow. So I did that film and then um, I got pregnant. And that also changed the whole, For sure. the whole thing. And after that, um, also by that time, my husband... I, he worked a lot overseas, so I live in many countries mm -hmm. in that time. So it was very difficult for me to continue the career while being a mom and while being with my family and wanted to keep my family together. Um, so I kind of, I still work, but like in commercials. Right. I did second units for El Chivo in commercial, second units for Rodrigo, um, because we were in LA, right? Mm -hmm. Or oh, for Javier Perez Grobet. And uh, so, you know, kind of took me off a little bit, but never losing my purpose, Focus, yeah. right? And then by 2005, uh, sorry, by 2000, we went back to Mexico. And I lived in Puerto Vallarta for five years. And that allowed me to start taking my career back in Mexico City. So by, again, I started doing documentaries, commercials. I shot a very, uh, very important documentary uh, called Recuerdos, Remembrance is the name in English, uh, by one of my, um, uh, my friends uh, from the CCC, which is the school where I study. Mm -hmm. And um, I did that in 1999, 2000. And it did really well. We won the Guadalajara Film Festival. Uh, she won the Rockefeller Grand, uh, the Rovirosa uh, Prize, Locarno. So that documentary did really well. I was nominated for Best Photography with that documentary. Oh, wow. So that helped me to start, you know, pacing and getting 
to to work. But it's not really until I can say, uh, which is also another interesting story. Uh, in 2005, it's a direct a Mexican director called Alejandro Springal. Alejandro Springal was very well known by a film called uh, Santitos. Okay. Okay. So suddenly I receive a phone call. I'm in Puerto Vallarta because also I'm a professional sailor. And I was in a regatta in Vallarta in that time. And um, I received a phone call from a producer. And it's like, Sally, you know, I have this script. I think you're perfect for it. Why you don't take a read? And I'm like, well, listen, I'm in a regatta. But, you know, when I come back to Mexico City, I can. No, 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 no. You don't understand. I need you to read the script today. Because if you say yes, you start shooting on Tuesday. And this is a Saturday. <laughs> Right, and it's Alejandro Springal, the director. Uh, you know, we already have everything for the movie. We actually shot the first week of the film, but uh, the DP and the operator that Alejandro had didn't work for him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we need a new DP. Okay, so it's my first fiction film in Mexico, right? So I call my friends, Memo Granillo. Chivo, and I'm like, guys, well, I have this great opportunity. I'm sorry, I want to just say something. Mm -hmm. This it was really something for me because I had already tried many times, and they put my name on it for to do different uh, feature films, mm -hmm. and they never accepted me. Right. Right. So you're facing a lot of rejection at this yes. point. Yes. And not, yeah, and I think the rejection it was a lack of trust. Right. You know, a lack of trust of is a is a very uh, still is today, even though we're more there are more women DPs, but it was a very male um, dominated dominated area yeah. of filmmaking, which is camera, and also at that time again is the beginning. I didn't shot my first digital thing until 2010. Wow. Everything else I shot before it was on film. So the cameras were super heavy. Uh, it, it was more difficult than what it is now. And anyway, so for me to have this opportunity after many rejections, it was like... You need to take well, it. Well, yeah. you need to take it. So I remember, <laughs> I remember when I talked to Memo Granillo and, and I said, Memo, what do you think? You know, I have no time to prep the film, but they have the locations, they have the team, they have everything and they need a new DP and they're going to start everything from the beginning. Anything that they other DP is shot, they're, they're gonna not going to use it. it. Okay. And <laughs> Memo said to me, say, well, Chaparrita, if you're going to do it, you have the biggest cojones I know because <laughs> I will not do it, right? Wow. So in English will be, you know, you have yeah. a very big balls to do <laughs> it because I will not do it. And I'm like, well, I have them because I'm going to do it. So I show up on Monday night, Tuesday morning. I meet for first time the director. Hi, nice to meet you, right? I go to the locations. Um, I meet the gaffer. I meet the key grip. And everybody and on Wednesday I start shooting and I shot six weeks of a movie that is called um, Maurice está en Hebreo mm -hmm. which in, in English is my, my Mexican, Mexican Shiva, Shiva. Mm -hmm. right and Alejandro became my one of my best friends wow. um, so I think uh, yeah so you know life keep giving me these opportunities but it's always about courage and how brave I am to take them. Yes. Still at that, I mean, at that time, right? Wow. And yeah, so then um, after after that film, I did another film in Mexico right away, one after the other one, uh, called Gabri Is, uh, Is Bert de Gabriela Dosen Die. Es mejor que Gabriela no se muera. Uh, Sergio Mansky is the director, also an Imcine film. I shot nine weeks, uh, you know, a very mm -hmm. wealthy <laughs> Uh, time budget time, yeah. and also um, Super 35, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, I shot for Alejandro Springal again. And even though it wasn't something that I really wanted to do, I think it was an opportunity to also uh, explore another part of instead of so independent filmmaking in Mexico, 
could go to more commercial one. I did a movie that is called It's Not You, It's Me. Um, not as tu soy yo. Mm-hmm. Um, with Eugenio Derbez, which is, which is an actor uh, with very, uh, very well known. And it was the fifth largest gross movie in until that time, until 2009. So, uh, you know, it's a, a nice comedy. I'm, I'm proud of it in the way of uh, it's elegant. It's not a cheesy comedy, mm-hmm. right? So um, I think, uh, you know, it was good for me to just see what was like, no? And, um, and I think it was good. But after that, for personal reasons, um, I came to Canada. My ex-husband, which was the lead actor of the series, he's Canadian. Mm-hmm. And um, I was back and forth for a couple of years, um, again, for a situation uh, with my father being a politician. And um, and Rob doesn't want it to be there. Daniel, my son, also we didn't want it to be in Mexico with this kind of situation and yeah. threats to my dad sure. and us my sisters and I, so I didn't want him to to grow up that way. And so we decided he was better coming here to live in Canada. But at that moment, I have to support my family and the way that I could support my family was in Mexico. So I have to be back and forth. I did commercials, blah, blah, blah. But in one of the times that I'm here, Canada changed the immigration laws for Mexicans. Before we were, um, we didn't need to have a visa to come to Canada. Yeah, it was on with the passport. Yeah. You were coming in and out. That's how I came, right? Just with my passport. But at that moment, they decided the Mexican needed to have a visa to come to Canada. So here I am in Canada, and the visas were taking nine months. Okay? Jesus. And I was like, I'm not going back. And if something happened to my son, I can come back to Canada. So... At that time, I was already separated, but uh, still married. And I asked Rob, you know, can you help me just, you know, to get my... my residence, mar- yeah. And thanks God, everything went fine. I I remember I went like, well, I need an agent, right? In the internet, I look <laughs> for the best agencies in Canada for DPs. But by this time, I have, you know, seven... Uh, feature films under my arm so I felt more confident also still you know in 2005 uh, 2010 actually sorry 2010 when I came to live here to be a female DP it still was something very no very new very new and common yeah. right so um, I got the agency they signed me in half an hour they saw my demo reel you know, I was prepared. I did a hundred copies of my demo reel. And I was like, I don't care. I'm going to go and knock every door and I'm going to show my demo reels and blah, blah. The first one got me. First try. Yeah. Wow. So I was like, okay. And two months later, I was shooting my first feature film in Canada, which That's is amazing. Foreverland, right? Foreverland, which was, you know, a 3.5 million movie, which is good for Canadian yeah, yeah, it's movies. A, it's w- way higher budget than anything in Mexico, right? I guess. And it so was far. Juliette Lewis, and I have a great uh, actor. So, um, And then from there, slowly, slowly, all these years, um, it's been a matter of people knowing me, um, you know, and it's been very good. You know, people likes to work with me. Um, so it's been a very good time for me mostly from I can tell you from four years to now why I'm saying this because I finally got into serious which it was something very hard for for me to get because it was like a catch-22 yeah it's like you don't have serious well if you don't give me a serious I can have serious yeah, you don't have any experience so you can't <laughs> but, do it but you can't do yeah. it because you don't have any experience exactly yeah. right <laughs> And at that time, you know, with 20 feature films under my arm, it wasn't still enough, yeah. trust me. So, but since Dickstown, uh, I think uh, Dickstown, which was a really small uh, series, but it did very good for me because uh, two years in a row, they nominated me for best photography in a series, a Canadian series. So the Canadian Screen Awards, I was nominated twice, year after 
back like two years in a row, which was very good. And, uh, and then I did a film called The Cuban, which I won the Whistler Film Festival with photography, best cinematography in a feature film. And once I did this down, it was good for me because then it opened a world that I didn't know, for sure. which is a serious world. A still film is my love, and I try to combine my work. Actually, right now it's a movie of mine on... On TIFF? Rosie? It was on TIFF, on Rosie, but right now it's in the movie theaters. It opened in all Canada. Oh, wow. So it's doing, you know, it opened yesterday. Uh, so I hope it does really, really well. Nice. Again, small movie, $1 million. dollars. We shot it in 16, 17 days. Wow. And um, we never expected to finish on TIFF. And, but you never know. But I love the the script. I love the story, and uh, and that's what he normally drives me to my work. Right. Right. So, yeah, and you know, and right now, um, I did my first American series in America, in the United States. That was brand new cherry flavor. No, brand new cherry flavor was done in Vancouver and oh, Los Angeles. Okay, so that's the Canadian American show. Exactly, right. it was a American show, but shot mostly in Canada. Okay, so still in this side. Right. But a friend of the family is my first big show shot in in United States. Right. And you know, it's uh, hopefully will bring more work. But that's more or less my transition Your but path. I be, and I you know I work in Latin America too I work in Chile I work in Venezuela um, shooting with different directors um, I still shot for a while in Mexico uh, but I never you know I never expect to do so so well, so well like my so idea was always to come back yeah. to Mexico always but right now and as I see my career taking more you know more traction right more, now. Yeah. yeah. And my name is now getting more recognized and people is more uh, looking for me in here in the United States. It's like I don't know if I'm going back to Mexico or I will go for a project. Right. It has to so, be the right project for you to go back. I think so. Yeah, yeah I think so. And um, and now in the world of series and everything, it's so easy to, to fall into serious but it's really like a soap opera mm. and I don't want to do a soap opera yeah, it has and I don't want to do a, a certain bad way, comedy and sure. I also don't want to do biographies about Vicente Fernandez <laughs> sorry I'm I'm sure they're very good but I don't want to do that Yeah. so yeah I'm waiting for projects that I can first of all there are stories that I feel that are important to tell if you look at at what is my work Um, you will see a lot of uh, one movie is about cystic fibrosis, another movie is about um, Asperger's, another movie is about immigration, another movie is about how is to feel an alien in another country, another one is about you know uh, about yeah, how important subjects that need to, to be me, no, and they, they're in a way I feel they are important for, for sure. people to know. So that's what it drives me, like a story that it will create consciousness, it will create awareness, right? Yeah. So um, that's what I feel, like that's what is my, my searching in the projects that I do. Of course, are projects that I have done, for example, Brand New Sherry Flavor, you can as well, Brand mm -hmm. New Sherry Flavor is not <laughs> that, but it was a big challenge for me. I was a challenge because I never done that gender. I mostly done drama um, and I never did horror, which I don't want to call it horror. It's not quite a horror, but it is. it has some elements of it. It has some elements of horror, but I call it more like a like a fairy tale. Like magical realism yeah, horror. Kind of, yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, and what I, I, I was like, okay, well, you know, what is going to be? And then... When I, you know, when taking and, and start creating the vision with the director and, and the showrunner for the series, like I told you, but like, well, if the lead actress is puking <laughs> cats, <laughs> what I cannot do with lighting, right? Yeah, no, you So have I was like... Creative 
liberty and freedom. Exactly, right? So I was like, wanted. well, yeah. I'm going to go with this and that. And it has brought me so much um, goodness yeah. uh, to be, you know, free of, yeah, to, to give, right? to have that creative freedom. Yeah. I want to talk about the projects a little later, but mm -hmm. yeah, we're going to go more into brand new cherry flavor and a friend of yeah. the family because they're amazing. They look Thank you. incredible. Thank um, you. But I wanted to ask you a couple more things about, yeah. um, I mean, you, it sounds like you were in the right places at the right time and you had the skills to take care, to take those opportunities and make the most of them throughout your career. And, and I mean, I just wanted to ask if, if there's, you've considered that you have uh, you have had a mentor or a, a teacher that has helped you or took you under his wing. You mentioned Perez Grobet, you mentioned Chivo, but would you say there's someone in specific that you would consider a mentor in that in that way? Mm, I probably will say two. Because, for example, Chivo and um, we're friends since high school. Right. Right. It's not like we met in the business. We are friends. We have the same friends um, since high school. Um, Cuaron, for example, is also a friend of mine since high school. Um, Rodrigo, I met him at, before the CCC in another school mm -hmm. in Mexico. They then close and then we uh, we find each other again in the CCC. But really, which the one I can tell you as a mentor for me, Markovich. Carlos Markovich was also a friend of mine from high school, the boyfriend of my best friend and everything. But And he was an amazing DP, really, like amazing DP. It just personally matters uh, have took him a different road. But um, I think him, I could consider my mentor because he gave me... Um, an opportunity to really look at this uh, what is really cinematography what is the art of lighting what is the concept of how a camera move are in it has an emotional intention in the story but also I can I consider a mentor and it was a teacher of mine Henner Hoffman And Henner Hoffman, again, is a Mexican DP, but also he lived many years in the United States. Uh, he's an ASC director of photography, but also he was the director of the CCC for eight years. And I consider him my mentor because, again, he was one of the first person to believe in me as a teacher, not as much giving me work, but mm -hmm. he saw in me my passion, I think, um, my determination, um, to become and by believing in me he also helped me you know to to make better my craft and he will invite me to things he will you know to his shoots I will go and he explained me so it was sort of like like having private classes in a way you know which yeah. I didn't have at school so um, yeah so I think those two are like a mentors in the in presence like in person for because I have I have inspiration like another DPs there are being big inspirations in my life for but, sure but these are the guys that really that guided you and helped yeah, you and helped me you that's, know that's nice that's yeah. amazing um, when when it comes to the differences between Mexico and Canada uh, this is an interesting topic to me because I also I'm also Mexican I'm also from mm -hmm. I'm from Cuernavaca which is an hour south of Mexico mm -hmm. City But, um, I mean, obviously I didn't get into the film industry back in Mexico, but that's what I'm trying to do now here. Yeah. But what would you say are the differences between, um, I guess, Mexican sets, Mexican, the Mexican industry in general and the Canadian? For me, I think uh, if you look at the, at the industry and the films and the history of film that we have in Mexico, we are a culture that loves cinema, loves cinema. Canadians, not that much. If you see the number of directors, if you see the number of movies that are made at every year, the support that the government gives to the Canadian film industry is not like Mexico. I mean, we're talking probably before, um, even two years ago, let's talk about, 
In Mexico, they were shot 185 films a year. In Canada, they don't shoot in not even 30 years. 30. 30. Three zero. Wow. Okay? So that's the difference. We have, and that's what I think, also our our film industry and our cinema is so strong in the world. Because beside Cuaron and beside uh, Memo del Toro and beside Iñárritu, Alejandro Iñárritu, we have many other directors in Mexico. You know, uh, Carlos Reigada. Uh, you have many directors that are well-known and have won many, Rodrigo Pla and other festivals around the world. Locarno, San Sebastián, uh, you mentioned, no, mm -hmm. Tribeca, uh, New York Film Festival, etc. They have won I mean, the CCC itself, it has the most awards of a film school in the world. We are between the 13 best schools in the world by five years in a row. Yeah. It's no one Canadian film school in that list, for example. No, it's lots from Poland, it's NYU, um, no, but no one of Canada. And to me, working in the industry, I feel that the difference is we know as Mexicans who we are. We, you and I, yes, we are Spanish and indigenous and whatever, and maybe we have, you know, whatever. But we don't present ourselves like, oh, hi, I'm Mexican, but I'm 50% Spanish yeah. and I'm 20% uh, Tarasca and I'm 2% Basque. And in Canada, it's something that is very strange to me. The people is not enough to be Canadian. They don't settle with just by saying, oh, I'm Canadian. And it's, well, but my background is Scottish Irish. Yeah. And oh no, well, I'm Italian. And it's like, hmm. And I think that lack of identity, because again, it's a country, it's a very young country compared to Mexico, right? For sure. And the difference is we were conquered, not exterminated. Yeah. Right, the Spanish conquer us and mix with us. Here, they came and exterminate. That's the difference. Yeah. So I think the lack of that, if cinema is a window to the identity of a society, is still not well settled here. Yeah. And I can give you an example. If you look at the movies in Canada, every time that we try to touch an emotion, it's a joke. It's a moment of irony, sarcasm. It's not confronted going really into the deep emotions that we Mexicans can go through without shame. And we are not also afraid to show horror of our society, yeah. how bad it is. Because in Mexico, yes, we have racism, absolutely. We have um, you know, many, many problems, but we're not ashamed. Yes, we can show we're more um, raw in showing them. The Canadians are Canadians as they are, very polite, very nice. Oh, sorry for this, sorry for that, excuse me for this. I think their cinema is like that to me. Their cinema is... Uh, is Mild. Yeah. They don't go really for what is needed to say and what is the horrors that are happening in the society and the, not only the, you know, what happened to minorities and, and I have lived them because I have shot in many places in Canada and we, you know, we can be in Toronto saying, oh, it's an amazing, you know, multicultural city. Yeah, yeah Toronto, go to the north, yeah. right? So I think for me, saying psychologically and everything, that's for me the difference. We know who we are. And still Canada hasn't found it yet. And their stories are still trying to find a way. Now, with, I'm talking about the American, um, let's say the English speaking, speaking part of Canada. Of course. Yeah. Right. And in the part of Quebec, Montreal, I think the cinema is stronger. Again, they have a stronger identity. For sure. For sure. And that's a difference. I'm sorry, but I can tell now with my experience that it's true. You, if you don't know who you are, how are you going to ex expose it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even like a person. So I found with directors, 
And funny enough, I work with a lot of no Canadian directors. I right. work with a lot of Canadian, uh, sorry, the directors that come to Canada to shoot, Irish, Italian, right? Yeah, and they like me because they find a way in that I can interpret it, the scripts and everything, the passion that they have, right? The love, the no fear of express, right? And I think that what it, it it, they like about me that we have that from Mexico. Yeah, I'm sorry, but it's true or Latin America. Yeah. But in this case, we're talking about. Yeah, Mexico. and I, I think I've seen it here that a lot of the movies that do good are movies that are from that are, tell stories from like immigrants and their past and their identity, That's or correct. you know, native people from here that tell their mm -hmm. story with their identity, and that that makes a lot of sense. And I think you know, I think for me, that's a big difference now. In the way we work, mm -hmm. let's talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So, in the way we work, in, for example, in in Canada, they're very efficient, very efficient. You know, you can count uh, with that. But they're not taking risks. Another way that I learn, mm -hmm. I come from a world that, with a hammer, a piece of wood, and a nail, I can create anything I need. Here, if you don't have the precise tool, that, tool it, that it goes exactly with it, it's very difficult that they open their minds to that. Uh, I can give you an example. I shot Foreverland, and Foreverland was a road movie. They went from Vancouver all the way to Cabo San Lucas. Oh, wow. Okay. So I shot all the Vancouver part, blah, blah, blah. I go to Mexico, and I brought my team from Mexico. My gap, when the people that I normally work But I keep the gaffer to keep the continuity, right, mm. um, of the of the project. It was a Canadian is, gaffer. A Canadian gaffer, a very good one, super nice guy, John. When he saw my team in Mexico, and I have to cover three blocks, oh, well, not three blocks, but like a really long block, let's say, in Cabo San Lucas, and the, the sun was super strong, and I'm like, I can't shoot like this, the contrast is too high, I have no light, so I have to soften it. Mm -hmm. So I decide to put, you know, three silks mm -hmm. from the, the roofs of the houses. 20 by 20s. 20 by 40s. 20, wow. 20s by 40s, right? And John is like, these guys are not gonna do it. <laughs> and I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. Just look at them. Just look at them. In 45 minutes, I have that done. Wow. In Canada, it would take me. First of all, no, because we didn't have the permits to go into the into the houses, houses and... roofs. But you know, locations goes there. Hey, how are you? Listen, we're doing this movie. You know, Demian Alcazar is here. We, you know, oh, really, Demian? Oh, perfect. of course, of course, you can go up. <laughs> Please right? do it. That kind of wow. stuff that we have, mm -hmm. like a, we trust in him, like in the way that we relate. Yeah. So. We have it done, and John could believe it. We're shooting in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, and the generator went down. Down, like complete darkness. We have to shoot, right? And my key grip said, I can fix it. And John is like, no, we need a new one, and we we're thinking to stop. And Well, give me half an hour. If I can fix it, then we stop, and then, sorry, we have to bring another one from La Paz, and blah, blah, blah. He fixed it. How? Just the Don't ask me. And exactly. Went for it. And went for it. In Canada, that, we would that stop. can't happen. No. Yeah, they can't no. touch any equipment. That any is equipment not there. that then it's not theirs because it is because of that. Yeah. Well, it happened that you know my my key grip. It was an amazing mechanic, so yeah. he fixed it, <laughs> right? So. Creo que para mí esa es como la, la gran diferencia, ¿no? El, el poder tomar riesgos y poder tener ideas de último momento en donde, si estoy en México, suceden. Aquí las tengo que planear muy bien, porque claro. no puede haber una... Si algo fuera de lo que está planeado, porque toma mucho tiempo, eh, sí, aquí así trabajan, claro. ¿no? Pero por supuesto, te digo, son gente muy eficiente, este, y también con pocos gaffers he trabajado en Canadá que realmente sienten que su trabajo no es poner luces, sino que realmente es diseñar conmigo 
la estética de iluminación de, del proyecto. Claro, que propongan creativamente también. Exacto, que no es nada más este, ponme esta luz y ponme este, ¿no? Sino realmente trabajar así de, de, de concepto, claro. ¿no? En México me sucede menos. O sea, los gaffers, aunque son menos tecnológicos, ¿no? Eh, tienen como mucho más sensibilidad en cuanto a la luz y en cuanto al proyecto, por ejemplo, ¿no? Eh, entonces, me es como más... Eh, es Sí, la siento más como una colaboración, más que yo dando órdenes de claro. poner esta luz aquí y allá, ¿no? Pero no, nuevamente, esa es como la gran diferencia que, que yo siento entre, entre los dos, ¿no? Si quieres, nos seguimos en español, yo creo, ¿no? Más, más cómodo, ¿o cómo ves? Está hablando en español. <risa> I'm so sorry. No, it's okay, it's okay. It's no, 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 totally I'm so fine. sorry. Totally es fine. que me, des, me saqué porque... <risa> <risa> Perdón. Sorry, no. It's okay. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll keep going in English. Yeah, in English yeah. okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. No worries, no worries at all. ¿Quieres que repita lo que no, dije? No, no, para nada. Lo, ahí los subtítulos, ¿Sí? no, no, okay. sin problema. Um, okay. So when it comes to working on your projects, when you come into on board into a project, um, mm. I'm going to go more more into technical stuff, if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, do you normally go with the... Do you prefer going with the same crew? Would you have a go-to crew? Or is it always new people? Or? It's always new people. Okay. For some reason, it's always new people. Probably uh, my camera assistants, mm -hmm. my first ACs. But again, depends. No, um, I normally what I try is I'm operating. I would like to have my the camera assistants that I know. Mm -hmm. If I'm not operating, then depends on the operator. For sure, right? So, but because I move a lot. Uh, for example, if I work in Vancouver, I can take people from Toronto. If I work in Calgary, I can take people from Toronto. If I work in uh, LA, I can take people to Atlanta. It, you know, so every place I go, I get new crew. So yes. I'm very good at it. Like I'm, I'm very adaptable. Mm -hmm. um, and also for me, it's like, well, if I'm going to Colombia, why am I taking people from Canada? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> let's take people from there. And they know how they work. They, they know, know the place. Their place. They know the equipment, you know. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's like that. Maybe when I get, you know, bigger and then I have my, you know, the decision of doesn't matter where I go, I want my crew, I will do it. But right now, I like the experience of different crews. I like because they, they give me so much, you know, and, and I'm a DP that uh, I think the way that I like to lead my team is through passion, and, but also nobody works harder than me, nobody. I don't stop, I work like a horse, and I give my 110%, and I find that's, This is so nice, like to have always new people that can see that that I'm very different from many other DPs, and I'm I'm very loving in a good way, not, respectfully, of mm -hmm. course. But um, but I'm a human, and I treat them like humans. Yeah, it's all about the people. You know, right. it's about my people, and and once you're my crew, I defend you. I I do whatever it needs. Uh, so I don't know. For me to get to know now, I have so many friends all around the, the world. world. Yeah. You know, which I love because, you know, they invite me to their houses. I meet their families, their kids, their moms. Um, they become, we go to baseball games. We go to basketball games. We do things together. So it's not just a job. Mm -hmm. It becomes a community for me. It becomes my friends. And I love that. I love to be able to have that opportunity. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And when you're thinking about, when you're going on board into a project, Uh, and you're reading the script, do you normally have like a a go-to, I guess, lighting package or your favorite lights or everything? Or is no. it everything, every time is new, you consider everything that you need? Yes. I think um, two things that I don't like to do. When I read the script, it's no thinking in images. Like I'm not thinking about how I'm going to do it and all this. No, I want to feel it. Mm -hmm. For me, it's reading it and see what is the response that I have emotionally to the story. No images. It's like going to a movie and I don't look at the photography. I see the movie. Yeah. And then, you know, if, if I see something there, oh, I go and see it again. But I try not to. I Because then 
the reason that I do what I do, the job that I do, I, it gets lost. And uh, I want to create magic all the time, the magic that the film gave to me. It gave me the magic to new worlds that I didn't know, the live stories that I will never leave, the fell in love of when I was heartbroken, meant my heart. I know I'm very corny, sorry, but, <laughs> but it's true. You know, it, it film did that to me. Yeah. And that's what I'm here. I want to give that to people. So I don't think technically. Technically, it's just the tools to interpret my sensitivity and the vision of a director. But what is important is the motion for me, how I can translate in my, in the memory of the feelings that I have, give it to the story, right? In a new way. Because I can make, you know, movies about uh, love stories, for mm -hmm. example, many of them. But then how that I can bring something new, if they are going to look the same, then what is the point? Yeah. Right? So you don't believe in formulas or? No. No, I never done that. To be honest with you, mm. I know our DPs and very good DPs that they do that. And I respect that. But that's not who I am. Right. That's not the job is not about my photography. The job is not about how good it's going to look and I'm going to get nominated or not. If it gets good, you didn't notice it. Very good. I did yeah. a great job. Right. Yeah, but it served the story. That's correct. Yeah. That's how I feel For sure. about it. So when I read the script, my first thing is how do I feel about it it's a story that I want to tell how I can contribute to the story right because you know they offer me Star Wars uh, Star Wars Star Trek mm -hmm. here in, in Toronto which is an amazing show but I have nothing to say to be honest with you mm -hmm. no it's open closed doors open closed doors enterprise yeah and I respect who they do it and they look great But, and they wanted me to do a whole, and like. It's not for you? Not for me. Yeah. My agent was killing me. <laughs> like, what? Are you crazy? How like, can you turn this on? But, you know, I respect the work and I know it can give you uh, prestige if you want. Mm -hmm. But it was to do that a friend of the family. No, for sure. <laughs> I think no, I make a good decision. Yeah, there's no comparison. No? Yeah, I no. think I make a good decision. Of course. And when you, you're talking about, you obviously go, First, you go blind to when you read a script. Yeah. You go first and you feel it. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, there's a process of visualization, right? And there's a process of you bringing ideas forward into how it's going to look. Do you bring references? Do you create storyboards? Do you create... How do you communicate that to a director or a showrunner? Uh, it depends. Because many times, I receive the script and then I have to give the visualization. But many times, too, they send me the lookbook Mm -hmm. the director have done, okay? So once you see the lookbook, when you have already a reference from the director, I think the, the thing that I try to do is not feeding her back or feeding him back mm -hmm. with the same thing, is how I take that and then reinterpret it from the image point of view, from the contrast point of view, from the framing point of view, from uh, the type of lighting, Then I keep it back. Mm -hmm. I don't like to do a lot of film references. Okay. Um, I like to do something that is not done yet. For me, and again, are many DPs that are copy paste mm -hmm. and they copy scenes exactly the same way. And I'm not like that because to me, it's the, I don't know how to explain it, but like for me, it's how I'm going to create something that I don't even know how it's going to look like. I have an idea, but I don't have a hundred percent that is going to work. Yeah. Right. That how I'm going to create the look like how, and that's what excites me. It's like, no, like, okay, it's going to look like children of men. Mm -hmm. Well, this been done. Yeah. But what, no, oh, it's going to look like this. No, I want us to create a new way of taking, you no, know, this project. I know it's an era or if it's an, you know, if it's already a period one, mm -hmm. but I didn't, example, friend of the family, 70s. It was very easy to go, very easy to go for me into ectachrome, the ectachrome look. 
super saturated colors, saturated reds, saturated blues. But I live in that time. And I wanted to look like at the photographies of me and my family of the 70s. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. That's what you see in the friend of the family. You feel the period. Yeah. You, you see it and you... But it's how I remember my childhood. And that's how I interpret it. Because it's like, oh, it's 70, so let's go right away to Ectachrome. It's like, it's been done. It's like yeah. a cliche. It's like... And I wanted to create with the friend of the family a nostalgia. Because also the music, as you notice, mm -hmm. if you have seen it, the music is a big part of the series. So the, not just the costumes and everything, but the, the, the lighting and everything, it needed to be like nostalgic, but natural, but realistic. And no, I didn't, I didn't want it to manipulate it so much. Right. Right. So that's just an yeah. example. So you, did you find yourself going through your own pictures? No. Or is, so you don't have I any? I go, normally what I do is in my visualizations and I can show you the latest, the late one I, I just did. Oh, that would be, be amazing if you want later after. Yeah, I'll show you later. Um, I go to painting, I go to photography, still, still photography, yeah. Sometimes journalism, if I can say, uh, or, you know, photographers. Why is that for me? Because they photograph reality, mm -hmm. right? And that's something that I can base myself from there and transform that. Movies is a great reference when a director wants to give it to me. Mm -hmm. because when it's given to me, then I know how he or she are thinking about it. Like, ah, okay, this is what... And sometimes it can be, can you please watch this scene in so-and-so movie because the rhythm of the camera is the one I want, mm -hmm. no, for example. Right. So having reference that haven't been done, hey, listen, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Yeah. But I want the director to know that I'm not up to, to do a copy paste. I can feel the presentation with movies that I have already done. For yeah. me, it's not the point. For me also, you know, somebody told me, oh, well, I have a photographer that gives 300 reference. If you give 300 reference, <laughs> then you, you don't have, have anything, no. no idea. Exactly, you have no idea. Yeah. No, I, I'm, you know, I'm very clear on why I do it and, and everything. But that's something that I, I It's important to me. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of seeing the same thing over and over. over, and over. Yeah. I know all the pictures of shock tech, you know? Yeah. Everybody takes shock tech to do a presentation. I know that. I can do that. But that's it, really? And also shock tech is not even European films. It's just American films. Yeah, just Hollywood. I want to change that. I want to see another way. I want to, uh, you know... I did a philosophy and image masters, and I'm doing right now a, a workshop on cinematographic appreciation. And if I can tell you how much I'm learning, I'm now 56, you know, and I want to learn so much, and yeah. I want to keep trying that we can change the way the the series are made. I'm tired of seeing master cover coverage coverage. Mm -hmm. I hate that. I want to do something different of the way the women also are viewing film. So I'm always looking for things that it's not the same. So in my presentations, in my visualization, I look for that. And in the presentation, I talk about texture of the film. Texture, I mean, uh, how, no, well, I'm going to use the lens so and so on because the lens is something that the director and I will choose together mm -hmm. and have the feeling for it. I can have an idea of lenses because I have more knowledge. For sure, you have right? a vocabulary of lenses. Exactly, of lenses. And then I can, after talking with the director and knowing uh, the perception and what he or she is looking for, then I can say, okay, I'm going to show you three sets of lenses in tests mm -hmm. that I think are the right ones. And I and use them, choose. and then we choose, yeah. right? And that's, but so I never, 
go, oh, well, it should be shot in 239.1 or 185.1 because that's not for me to tell. Mm -hmm. I think for me to tell is the light. The frame, what is my intention with the framing? What is my intention with the lighting? What is my intention with the rhythm? How is my intention with the texture? That's, I think, for me, the parts that in a in a visualization is called mm-hmm. uh, are important for me. The di- the director had an idea how I think, and then if, you know if he, they think that I'm the right person, and we are kind of sharing the same vision, of course it's easier to work with a DP that shares the same vision. They're trying to convince. Yeah. A DP to go to your vision. Yeah, it's your, just pulling in the same direction instead of exactly, uh, opposite. Yeah. Exactly. And that's where is, I think the confrontations come more, right? When For you sure. have two people with two different bi- visions pulling in different directions. Instead still. of communicating and compromising. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, that, I think that's a great segue into maybe taking a look at some shots, some sure. things from... from Brand new cherry flavor and friend of the family, okay. Because those are your latest uh, works, yeah. and I think there's a lot of things that we can go into. Absolutely. First of all, I, I would just like to know how do you how do you land into that position? How do you get that job? Pretty much. So Nick and, and Tosca is the showrunner and creator of this show. Five years ago, he did his first series. He's very young. He's 39 now. He did a show, if you are in the horror thing, I, I'm not, but I'm sure, you know, he did a show called Channel Zero. And it's a series, uh, a horror, horror, straight down horror film. Um, I mean, series. And he wanted me to do that series five years ago. Uh, it was shot here in Winnipeg. So um, thank you very much. I have the interview with the director. The director and I really... We got really along. got along really well, but then, you know, NBC, and this is the textual worlds, words, which uh, was very hurtful for me. Um, he said that uh, they will not approve me because they needed an alpha male DOP. What? That was the words. And that there is, this is a male world, and then <laughs> we're not sure if I could deal with a male team. Okay. And I'm like, so what do you think I've been doing for 25 years? <laughs> Working with all girls, like all girl team. I, you know, like that, so is... that and it, that, it just was like, I'm never going to make it. Like, really, yeah. like, not going to. Bro- I make a super nice visualization. Nick loved me, the director and everything. And NBC was like, no, we need an alpha male deal. Alpha male. That's, that's, why, that's oh how they call God. it. Anyway, the time went by and I did a film called Angelic Sile. Mm-hmm. And I met Floyd Kane. Floyd Kane at in this movie, because they have a company, they produce movies, had a TV series under the arm that he was going to pitch. And fixed them. And he f- fought for me for CBC, in CBC. And it's like, no, it has to be Seliana. It's Seliana, my DP, and, that, and they approved me. And after Dickstown, Nick came back for brand new cherry flavor. And guess what? You NBC know. approved me, right? <laughs> so that's how I got it. But I, I'm so thankful for, for this because, you know, Nick is the one that asked for me again. Mm. No, it's like I want to work with her. I, wanna, I don't know what he saw, but it's like I want her for this project. And they approved me. I'm the only DP in, in that series. And, uh, and like I say, when he told me more or less what it was about, it's like, this is crazy, <laughs> right? And then I, you know, I talked to the directors and everything and it's like, okay, we're, we're going, we're going yeah, we're and it's going, going to be as crazy cool. as it needs to be. Exactly. <laughs> so this set, no, the apartment, Lisa's apartment, as you notice, I don't have uh, a grid in, mm-hmm. in the ceiling. Yeah, because you can see the ceiling. It's hard, hard ceiling, yeah. which makes it really tough, right? Because that means that I'm coming from the windows, mm-hmm. basically, right? And, or the practicals or um, the 
the light from the apartment itself. Of course, this is a set, you know, uh, we have trans lights in the windows, but it's also in 1990. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, a, an era that I live on it. Yeah. And I remember, you know, the, the lighting in, in Los Angeles. I, I happened to be living in Los Angeles at the time, you know, and we have all these mercury vapors in the streets mm -hmm. there were no of course leds that we have now so we have if you see the movies of Bean vendors or you have seen paris texas so mm -hmm. that's very it, that kind of greenish lighting exterior mm -hmm. so i want to implement that the light coming you know from some of the windows as mm -hmm. if were lights street lights there are filling the spaces right so in basically what we have in in the kitchen i have tubes mm -hmm. okay of course they are um esteras uh mm -hmm. to be able to control the the light but i put them in the color temperature as it were fluorescence okay. right uh green cyan -y, right then of course uh in the bedroom we have a lamp that is giving us incandescent so i just bring that up a little bit mm -hmm. i have a feel that I was bouncing, just to give at the bedroom a little bit of, of this warmer light. But also, I have a light coming from the window. There is the blue light that you see on yeah, the, on the TV, TV and, and in the corner. In, what light were you using out there? I I was using uh, HME eyes okay. with a quarter uh, plus green. Okay. And I was using also... No, that's it. In that one, that was it. Plus green in the HMS because they are 5,600. So I just make it a little bit more cyan Okay. Then in the bathroom, I have the same light. That's the light that you see in the door. On the door. Yeah. Uh -huh. I have an HMI here. Now they were projecting to the to the door. Right. This one here was at 2,500. And in here, in, this, in the bathroom, because I needed a longer... Uh, shaft, mm -hmm. I still use it to play pondering. Okay. In the um, living room area, as you notice, I have the light that is hitting the closet. Mm -hmm. In here, I have three windows. Normally, I have three lights. Okay. In here. And these three lights, I uh, normally were using 10Ks. Okay. Okay, tungstens. Mm -hmm. And what I did with the tungsten light, so these are 10Ks in here. Right, but I had a half plus green, and I have a quarter a straw. Because if I didn't use the straw, then you know the light with the plus green will be very green. So I needed to balance it a little bit. So this is my combination for this kind of thing. Okay, and that's basically it. Everything else are lamps, like the little practicals, little yeah. practicals in here. Um, and again, you know, this light, for example, this window is giving us the on bluish light the on the table. table. Uh -huh. This one here is giving us in the wall, right? In there yeah. where she's crossing right now. And this one is giving us the closet. And you just use the, I guess, the shears on the window to give that texture on the... Uh, I didn't have shears, I have blinds. Blinds, blinds, sorry. Yeah, yeah I have blinds. And I, th yeah, I think in some of the windows I have shears, but basically just to have the pattern, which again is, is from the era mm -hmm. too. You know, so, and that's, that's something that I really love that when people saw the work, um, they told me that they feel like you were yeah. in that period yeah, of time. And I think that's something that you're amazingly good at, at just building the world and building the environment that you are really immersed in. And you really buy that it's that period and that. The, uh, and I think that's the point, yeah. right? What we would love to do is create a world where yeah. these characters are going to be living and, no, but... Um, For sure. And it's like you you not only believe that you're in that world, but you only believe the rules. And like the, it doesn't seem crazy that she's spitting out kittens and that she's doing, exactly. going through all of this crazy stuff. And another right? thing that is very important about mm -hmm. brownie sherry flavor and uh, also about a uh, friend of the family in a different style if you notice why I could do this crazy lighting like this and why I can have so many, because it's one camera. Yeah. This shot that you choose, if you see it, it's one, one camera. camera. Even the even the coverage of the, the two people, right? <laughs> so those, that's only one camera. <laughs> like I think I told you, what is the difference 
between film and TV series. In film or in a movie, mm -hmm. you put the camera where it needs to go. In a series, you put the cameras where they can go. And that's not the point for me. Yeah. I still want to put the camera where it needs to go to tell the story. But if I have a second camera, it's, it's not allowing me to do it. Mm -hmm. Because what it works beautifully for this one -er that we did, yeah. imagine it intercut with a second camera. Yeah, no, it's, not, it's impossible. And, you, oh, but, but if you and have the a wonder, lighting, you, exactly. The lighting will never work because if I put the camera here, I'm looking at the whole apartment, right? Yeah. It have to be here. It will be all flat. Yeah. Because all my light is coming from the windows. Yeah. So and if I put it here or here or here, just to be like clear, the camera is somewhere. The camera travels from here, here all from here the way, mm -hmm. there, and then panning, and then it goes to the. That's right. To the closet. Yeah, that's awesome. Right? Yeah. And that's one of the things that you you like, I think, also. Yeah. And that's why this show, it did so well. Because when Nick talked to me, he said, I want the feeling of David Lynch. But it's going to turn into Cronenberg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So I was like, okay. <laughs> right? I think the pilot, the episode one, mm -hmm. is a completely David Lynch feeling and it's People were saying, well, it's a little bit slow. <laughs> it's not a slow. It's, it has a intention. Yeah, it has a pace. Right? And slow. actually, I, I did an homage to David Lynch. I have the shot, you know, from Moholland Drive, I, I think, or... Um, no, no, it's not Moholland Drive. It's um, Lost Highway. Lost Highway. So I did an homage for <laughs> that for him, <laughs> you know. So, But I think that's what you like, too. Yeah, no, for sure. The narrative, yeah. the language. I didn't even notice the first time I watched it. It was just only one shot, like that whole sequence. And then I rewatched it and I was like, wow, <laughs> that's crazy. This is um, the first part is one shot. Once she mm -hmm. gets, Once she crosses the door, it's a different set. I this guess. is in Vancouver. The other set is in Los Angeles. Really? Yeah. And um, because we, we hit um, COVID. Right. So we shut down March 13th. So and you shot the first, the one or before COVID and then the second, the second part, part going through the door. Mm -hmm. How much time after? Eight months. Wow. So there's eight months between this shot and that shot. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it just looks, I mean, the continuity is perfect. You can't even notice. It just mm -hmm. doesn't even click. So tell me about that set, about the, I guess it's like a greenhouse. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a set, it's like a, yes, it's a greenhouse, all glass. Most of the plants that you see that we, we use in the foregrounds are real. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult to maintain yeah. and to move in the in that set mm -hmm. because, of course, you want the, the rich... Yeah, very rich environment. ...environment, but at the same time, you need a camera to move in there and lights to put in and... All that. So it was really a very difficult set to work with, to be honest. Yeah, so basically it's a box and it's, it's in an oval like this. Okay. Okay. And as you notice, it's all um, glass, glass around it, right? Um, in this case, um, we didn't have a ceiling again. They told me that they were going to put one in post-production. They never did. So all I had in here was a white. That from outside, I was bouncing lights to it. Okay? Okay. To here. To give the main ambience. Mm -hmm. Again, I didn't have a grid. Yeah. You know, I didn't have really a lot of lights hanging from the ceiling because I thought, well, intelligent if they run out of money and they don't are able to do the post-production that they think at least you have a white or dark yeah. ceiling depending on day or night so right can... what you see in that windows are translites i have translites in here and i have plants this is the entrance 
Mm-hmm. So it's like a little co- a little hallway now that is full with plants. And in here is all windows too. And I have plants here okay. to make it like this and just like a blue backdrop in here or a dark black drop if it was night. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? So you have the what it later becomes the pool here. But if you remember in previous episodes is where Boro is tattooing the yeah. zombies. And you see, oh. I have um, fluorescents in there. Uh-huh. Those, I have them everywhere to give me, you know, a little bit of more, uh, yeah, more depth. depth. Yeah. To know where they are. Yeah. Right. And we have the pool as well that you Yeah, talked the about. milk pool. Yeah. Oh, I love you too. Do you want to say that this match cut is great? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And I love the shot. I, this shot, I saw it and I told the director and he loved it. Yeah, it's great. Are you using a crane? Yes. Like a techno crane? Yeah. Right. And there's something that I'm noticing too. It's like you have, I mean, maybe not in this one, but you have the bokeh of anamorphic lenses, but it doesn't look like anamorphic. I, <laughs> yeah. So the lenses that I use are called the mini hawks. Uh-huh. And the mini hawks is a hybrid between anamorphic and spherical. Mm-hmm. And that's why I chose them. I needed a lens. Um, I didn't want to go with anamorphic because I thought that the strike flares, mm-hmm. it was something that I didn't want to use. And also we wanted to be classical. We wanted to go 185 one. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, no, this one at the end, we went to two, 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 one. two to one. Mm-hmm. We went to two to one, but we didn't want it to have like, and I didn't want also a lens because I thought, well, maybe I can go with something very vintage, but I didn't want a lens that had so much personality that will be distracted. Too notable, yeah. But suddenly, like in searching, I found these mini hawks. I start diving into them, didn't know them. I knew the hawks, but not the mini hawks. And I found that it's a hybrid. So they give you the bouquet of the anamorphic, but you don't have the striking, mm. uh, the strike. But they don't flare. squeeze the image or? No. Right. No. So not only that, every lens becomes a macro. Oh, wow. So you have very... Everything that you see I, is not like a macro. Is this lens. I did macros like for very specific things. Yeah, I think there's one, right? It's very this? close to... It's a, yeah, it's, it's my lenses. It's not a macro. And what are you using there? Like a, is that like a 20? I probably were, were using like a 24. 24? Yeah. Because you can see a little bit, you know, already a, a lot of like, you know, yeah, the distortion. Distortion and, of the face. Yeah. That's amazing. And honestly, this show was shot with very few lenses because mm-hmm. the mini hawks are only three sets in the world. I have one, <laughs> one set for two cameras. Wow. And it's only seven lenses. So it goes from, what's the widest it go? I think the widest was a 17 millimeters. Mm-hmm. And then it goes, the tightest one is a one, 135. Okay. But what I did sometimes, it was, I used because I didn't have more lenses and the look was so specific that I used doublers to make the longer lenses if I needed to okay. because, you know, I the bouquet, I couldn't put an anamorphic yeah, yeah, and I yeah. did, couldn't put a, a spherical. So it was very tricky to do For that. Sure. So I used doublers. So I still have the same bouquet. It was a really... Uh, I mean, a great discovery for me, and I think it works really well with the series because it still is something like, hmm, and it has some um, also some distortions in the highlights that are different from anything else that I saw, but it's not so distracting. Mm-hmm. So I thought it was the perfect lens no, for they, that. They look amazing, and, and um, it struck me that you, you do see the anamorphic qualities of it, and then, but you don't see the other ones, right? The other anamorphic yeah. qualities that you don't want it. Yeah. And, and in that case, it was that, you know, of course, anamorphic is a beautiful texture and, and um, I know people love them. But again, 
for what? Why exactly. are you telling? Why are you saying? Are uh, you in a room with two characters in a bedroom and you're using an amorphic? It's like a little bit of waste of money mm -hmm. and, and it's not really giving you much. Yeah, just for the real. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right? This one was very interesting, right? Because um, once we do this, this shot, which is a pullback, the next four scenes, if you notice, are the same frame. Yeah. And we just do the passing of time through lighting and set dressing. Yeah. So the idea, of course, is like how do we interpret this changing of, of, of time and seasons and, and everything. So I think it worked really well. Um, yeah, you just lock off the camera and move the lights around and change yeah, it. Yeah, and change it. And, you know, the the one of the things that I'm very involved, because it's important to me, is the set deck, like the set dressing. And I, you have a person with you that is always with me. Uh, there's a set dresser. Everything for me is a, it has a meaning and a reason to be on frame. It's not because it looks cool or because it is. So many of the things that you can see and they're put are decisions that I take for my composition in frame, even though the camera doesn't move, right? How long does this does a shot like this take? These shots, mm -hmm. these uh, five shots that we did, it took half of the day. Okay. Um, not because it was complicated in my part, but it, you have to imagine take the set down, down. put it up yeah. and of course we didn't want to move the camera so we have to wait between sets an hour probably to redress and sure. undress and yeah. at that time I'm moving the camera the, the, lights, the right? lights so let's let's I guess let's break it down a little bit mm -hmm. it's very simple it's like a train like this okay everything again as you notice is no grid it's mm, hard, hard ceiling. ceiling so the light in this uh, scenes are coming all from the window um, it's nowhere to hide <laughs> yeah. I don't have a place to hide so this is the living room this is the dining room and this is the kitchen okay in here I have three lights uh, in, in the living room sorry I have two lights one for the background mm -hmm. like for the wall yeah. and one that hits the character right okay in here for example I have two four Ks in this one here, I have a 112K. And in the kitchen, I have a 4K too. Those are all HMIs? Yes, sir. Okay. You know, filtration, color, height. But it's very simple. Um, in a space like this, with so tight, and the, the what is difficult to do is that this light it creates a double shadow with mm -hmm. this light. And yeah. this one creates a double shadow. So you have to put the lights, but also block. Flag them. Flag everything, you know, that is going to different. So something that I don't like and I never have, or I try never have, is a double shadow. Mm -hmm. That's when you know. It's lit. To me, it's lit. And if you dip knows how to light. Yeah. Right. So, because in the in the real world, this will be lit by the sun, which mm -hmm. is one source. One big source. Yeah. Right. But that's what I tried. So you flag in here, you flag in here, right? So you don't get double shadows. But it was so small and was so difficult. Um, but we were able to manage. That's why you know I don't have twelve Ks yeah. everywhere because I couldn't I couldn't, couldn't work. Manage the, yeah. The spill. And also the spill. And I was sacrificing so much the light. Then what is the point yeah. to have a 12K? If you're going to make it if so you're gonna little, make it so little, then use then, a smaller light, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And then in here, as you notice, it's very soft, mm -hmm. right? Very, very soft. You notice it's no big um, highlight on the table anymore. Yeah. So and I wanted... These little accents that... Exactly. That for you. And just, you know, I wanted to feel the, the winter time as Idaho, so it's snow mm -hmm. in the winter time. And it's not because I was in Idaho. It's because I research. Yeah. Right? For sure. That's so, the importance of research. Yeah. So and you use diffusion on this one, I guess. Of course. From the outside. Are you yes. have, do you have anything inside here? Um, no, just the, you just know, the, the light. No, I have nothing. Just the light that is coming from, from the window. 
Nice. And I guess this is a little practical too, right? The practicals are the ones that are under, oh, the, under cabinets, the cabinets. So they, they, they're they part of the of the, set. the design set. Yeah. How's your relationship with the set designer? Because I think we talked about the, the hard ceiling being a little bit of a, of a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the set being so small. Yeah. But I mean, it's very important for me with the production designer have a lot of conversations because, yeah. of course... His position is the responsible responsible of the whole visual um, aesthetic of the project. So between him and I, we work together. We have a lot of conversations, conceptual conversations, not only practical, mm -hmm. conceptual. What are we trying to say? What is the color? The why is this happening? Why is the Um, the texture that he's giving me in curtains or in the sofas, for example. And it's very important because he can have an idea, for example, on the color of the walls. But then I come in with my lights. And if we don't test them, then we're like, oh, well, the color that I chose with the lights that you put now is three times warmer than what I expected to be mm -hmm. or is too cold. Yeah. So we do test. We do flats of wood with different colors mm -hmm. and then I put the light how I think I'm gonna use it in color texture and everything direct not direct soft bounce every way that we can and see the result of that mm -hmm. and then we can take decisions in together yeah. like you know like uh, what is the right colors to go right so in that in that process of pre-production is that where you start setting the look of the, your I guess With your DIT as well, or my DIT comes way later. Mm -hmm. My DIT comes when I'm doing the camera test. Right. Once the lenses have been chosen, yeah, when we pretty much have the cast already and everything. So then he comes in. I have conversations, of course, with mm -hmm. him pre previous to that, and I don't like to do loots, uh, look up tables. I don't like them because I feel that they keep me with less possibility to move. Yeah. And I like the freedom of going anywhere. And I'm, I, well, I think I'm good at it. I can do it by eye. So I'm not the DP that, oh, I have a look for interiors, I look for exteriors, for night interior, for night exterior. Anything, all my work that you see is never done with lots. Right. Never. It's the DIT and I, we create as we're shooting. And then I'm always like, no, because the loot is to, let's go. Or I like the, like, Like in film, I right. So you do that on set the yeah. day of you, you, you. When I do my camera test and everything, we he can see mm -hmm. where I'm going in in color. So then it's easier for him. We don't start from the raw, of course. Yeah. It's like he applies that, like and then base. from the ch -ch -ch, we go. Yeah, and then you start yeah. adjusting. The But details. we do it on on set. That's interesting. Yeah, that's super interesting. I will say that probably a lot of TPs will say you're crazy and don't listen to me. But for me, it works. Yeah, and I like that. Yeah. I don't like the oh think 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 yeah, think. There's there's no rules to anything. It's like yeah. whatever works for you and and it gives you the freedom to be creative. Again because sometimes the scene for me calls for different things. Mm -hmm. In lighting even though it can be the same light but it's you know something that I maybe close a little bit more the the shaft of light because I feel that in that moment she's going into a, a a difficult moment so the light shouldn't be so bright right. and in the friend of the family you're gonna notice it episode one and episode three they are the brightest episodes mm -hmm. of the yeah it goes darker and darker and then it goes darker and darker as the character yeah. the bad guy B start getting control on them and they start feeling you know yeah. that's and the way yeah, you, you try to sell it as their happy family at the beginning and everything exactly. is right and everything is nice mm -hmm. Until this darkness comes yeah. and, and creeps then at, in through the house. Exactly. And then at the end, it's bright again, but it's a different brightness. Yeah. It has not nostalgic anymore. I haven't watched the finale, but I... <laughs> it has no nostalgic. Yeah. It's more, you know, and it also has past six years. For sure. For so. sure. Great. And I, I'm very interested in exterior days and your your take on, on that challenge, because it might be, <laughs> it's like a... Yeah, this, I love this, this scene. Yeah, it's love beautiful. This scene. Hey. 
Were you on location, I guess, yeah. It's not it's not green screen by any means. No, sir. <laughs> no. I'm in location. I love big whites. Yeah. Big, big whites. Which in TV is difficult because people feel that you lose the characters. But I think it gives you so much to, of the world. Yeah, it gives you the context. And it's often the most and, more challenging shots to make look I good. And I think as a DP, what is our job beside the, the look, the aesthetics and everything? is wherever our budget is, to make it look bigger. Mm. And how I, that happened? With white, sorry. If I'm in a close-up, I can show the world. Yeah, you just have, you can have a mm -hmm. world behind it. And it's so this scene is a push-in. It was a wonder mm -hmm. all uh, here. We start from the super white that you saw, yeah. and it gets to here. It was a wonder. Just one? one it from, was one. It didn't edit that way. Yeah, so it just but it was it from starts here. from here. Mm -hmm. And we have a dolly and we start pushing with a crane because if not, I will see the tracks. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that, that was my next question. So it's a crane, not a, not a truck. No, sir. It's like a truck with a crane because I have a telescopic crane, crane mm -hmm. but no, um, I couldn't afford the one that I needed. So I right. need to go up with a little one. Mm -hmm. And I put a zoom. So the zoom is also hidden. In the dolly in. So you're zooming in. Zooming dolly in, in and dolly. That's right. That's amazing. To get and here. Then you get the, to get here. It's beautiful. So it, I guess you have to schedule this pretty tightly to make it, to shoot it at a certain time of day, or how do you work about that? I shot the whole scene with coverage and everything in an hour. In one hour. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this looks fairly naturalistic, but it's stylized, and you're outside. How do you do that? I think for me, I mean, the way that you can do it is how that you block your scene. And if you have a director that can listen to you mm -hmm. and you explain why it's better, because it would be a completely different scene if I if we didn't put the cars in this way and for the sure. sun is behind. Yeah. If I go this way, one of the characters will have frontal light and the other character... Backlight and... Right? But in here, if you notice, the sun is from behind, mm -hmm. right? So the sun is, I guess, just out of frame. A little bit, yeah. It's coming from there. As you see, he has more light than her, mm -hmm. which is good for me. I chose that yeah. so she can have softer light. She's yeah. my lead. She's a woman. Yeah. I need to protect her. For How sure. do I protect her? I couldn't put anything, as you notice. Like, yeah. it's, this is a sun, right? And I just have the good luck that was sunny but overcast at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. the, the song never came out. And it was also kind of all at the end of the, of the day. Of the day, so you have mm -hmm. like that golden, nice sun. Yeah. Do you, have, do you add anything, I guess? No. Uh, not even a little kicker there? Nothing. So everything is just bouncing, I guess? Nothing. Or? Nothing, nothing. I, I did something in the tighter shots for her and him. Uh -huh. uh, just to have more contrast, I add a negative. And that's it? That's it. So this wrap is just natural? No, yeah. Nothing else. Wow, and this hair light is natural too. Everything. That's amazing. If it's overcast, for example, here in Canada right now, mm -hmm. we have a lot of overcast and we're going to have for the next six months. Mm -hmm. If I have no money to bring highlights, I bring contrast. For sure. So then I bring a lot of negatives. Yeah. And that's how I, you know, design or, you know, create a, a more... Like, is it a floppy? Is it a four by... No, in this case, uh, I was something bigger. Okay. I was like probably like I ate by. Okay. Yeah, a floppy. Yeah, it's it, too small. Yeah, for the size of frame. If I was in a tight close-up, yes, yeah. a floppy will do it. But in here, I couldn't have just shadow yeah. here and then the light. Body. It has to be the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And yeah, this is one of my favorite shots. scenes. Yeah, no, for in sure. The, in, the, too. in the series, <laughs> there's one that I. I It's also an exterior, it's kind of exterior interior day that mm -hmm. I, I really like and I would like to just hear your input on it. And it's funny, you chose the ones of my favorite episodes. Yeah. <laughs> I love this director. I think we work amazingly together. That ain't it. <laughs> Now, I didn't get a chance to wrap it. In this particular uh, location, of course, as you probably know, the big challenge was to be under this awning yeah. against the exterior. Yeah. All that fluorescence that you see, uh -huh. they were part of the awning. You didn't even change the bulbs or anything? They were part wow. of it. And they were 
I couldn't replace them uh -huh. because they haven't changed them since, since 1976. Really? Mm -hmm. So they're... They're the real thing, babe. Like, <laughs> that's the real thing. You see, there is actually one that is off. Uh -huh. I couldn't change it because the, the ballast, they don't exist anymore. That's crazy. And I was like, hey, it doesn't matter. It seems like natural, real yeah, no, to me. Sure. No, As you notice what's happening, the mm -hmm. sun is falling down. From that side. From that side. Okay, from so this I'm just side. I'm going to draw it. Because the sun was so harsh. harsh. And I'm, as you notice, I'm seeing everything again. Where the hell did you put the light? Or where did you put a, a diffusion? Of course, in the close-ups yeah. sometimes. But in here, look what happened. So I go from that close up into the two shot there and keep going. And I finish. I was finishing the close up when they hug uh -huh. to each other in the next cut. In there. this cut, that's where I finished the shot. So I came all the way like this and then mm -hmm. tilt up. What I did is as the light start going down to bring this space up, depending on the angles that I was using, I used two. 12Ks from here mm -hmm. when I was shooting in this direction, so I didn't see them. And when I was looking in this direction, I moved them to here. I think I was here. Okay. Yeah. And also, you know, as I start losing the light, I have parts that I didn't have the sun anymore and I have to put the, the 12Ks. Actually, yeah, one of them was an 18 and, and then a 12. Okay. And I have them through grid cloth. Okay. In, in a particular here. region, you chose grid cloth? Just for the texture. Okay. Uh, for example, in exterior days, when something that I, I don't like, this is personal taste mm -hmm. again, is you have the white and it's super harsh sun, mm -hmm. right? But in the white, it's yeah, okay. And then you close up and it's everything and soft. And it's super soft and, nice and then and it's like... Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. No. People normally do a silk. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I feel that it looks fake, not real, and everything. So I use something that is called highlight. And a highlight is a very thin diffusion. It's like a plastic. Imagine um, almost like a shower curtain. Mm -hmm. Kind of I, like the opal? And all no, those no, no, no. The opal is still paper. Huh. Uh, no, this is big, like one of the textiles okay, that we okay. use. Like you can do 12 by 40 or 12 by 20. And... But what it does, but that I really like, is it takes the edge of the hard light, mm -hmm. but it doesn't look cover. Right, it doesn't look too soft. Exactly. Right. I'm, I mean, really, it looks fake. When, yeah. when, yeah, when, yeah. You, when see you see that, like, silk. and it's the big silk on top, it looks like, really? Yeah. And then all the background is perfectly, like, super high. Yeah. Like, no. And what I did, as you notice, because they're, it's basically one dolly. Mm -hmm. We just put a track here and with the crane, so the we were able... Over here. The same track, it was a really... Long track. Really long track that we use. Remember when they arrive to this to this place for first time and they're running and he's showing her... Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, yeah. it's a dolly, not a crane or anything. It's a dolly with two guys... <laughs> and then we just turn around. Wow. Right? So... We did that. So to save time and being able to keep using this long, long track that mm -hmm. was probably around 40 feet, more mm -hmm. or less, um, we decided to use a U-arm, an offset that will allow me to get here. So then the shot that you saw of her, we start in her close up here and we back up, back up, back up. But it's like this. So... The track is here, offset, and the camera is in here. Oh, okay. Then when we're looking in this way, I'm using the same track on here. Then everything in this direction and in this direction and in this direction, I the use same this track. track. And also, as you notice, when I the only character, and that's again mm -hmm. something that we need to think before because of time, right? If I wouldn't put this track... It means that every shot that I needed to do, I need to, to move. move track. Yeah. And it was no time for that. So we decide to do this blocking, have everybody on this side, mm -hmm. having B and, and her on here, and only the boy is in the other side, right. which his coverage, I can do it so fast. Yeah. Right? And if you notice... Yeah, you're still on the same side, technically. Yep. 
right? Yeah. I have, yeah. So it was the only guy in case I needed to turn. That was it. Yeah, and it's such a sad scene too, like poor it's kid. Because he's in love of her and then the father treats him so bad, yeah. right? Yeah, and the uncle tries to be nice to him. Yeah. And I don't mind if you see when he goes and say, hey, I play cards with you. Mm -hmm. The son was so low by then that you have a flair yeah. on him. And it's soft and more damaged. But I felt that, you know, it's a, it's a scene, it's natural, yeah. it goes. Yeah. Why am I going to try to get myself into trouble trying to cover a flare that I can cover because mm -hmm. it's direct to lens? And, um, and it worked. That's awesome. What camera did you use for this? And what camera and lenses? Uh, I work with the Tribe 7 Black Wings. Okay. Mm -hmm. And were you on Alexa? Alexa Mini LF, large format. Nice. So we shot large format and it was important for me to go on the large format just for one reason the for me was important mm -hmm. the house if you notice is a very has very straight lines mm -hmm. have no arches nor it's straight lines and it's like a train yeah rack. i didn't want the bending of the verticals with uh um, angular lenses right so with the large format yeah you can use and my It, the, the the distortion is way pronounced. Way less. Yeah, because you, you, you can get away with longer lenses for wider shots, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. No, so you see more, but it's a longer lens, and it's, it has no distortion. So yeah. that's why when I saw the set and everything, and the idea, of course, no, it's not when the set was built, but mm -hmm. I saw the the ideas of the, you know, blueprints. The blueprints of of the, of the architecture and everything. I was like, okay, I have no. Uh, curves. I have nothing that w I can protect the distortion, and it's called all very straight mm -hmm. verticals and straight or it's uh, very yeah straight horizontal lines. Yeah. So that's why I I decide to go with large format. Nice. And also the other thing that was important is I have to disguise the modern world. Because yeah. I wasn't able to, as you can imagine, to cover everything. And we see streets in the background and cars. and everything. But with large format and the lenses, I was able to shorten my depth of field. Mm -hmm. Meaning the background will be easier out of focus, even with wire lenses. Yeah. So that's how I disguise more of the real world. That's super interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to finish it off with uh, what's next for you? What uh, Do you have any projects coming up or anything that excites you in the near future? Um, yes. I mean, it's always something that, that is coming. Thank you, God, because yes, it's, it's good to always have something. But um, yeah, right now, I this project, A Friend of the Family, was 10 months. Mm -hmm. And is uh, even though I have an alternative DP, you're on because if you are not shooting, you're prepping. Mm -hmm. And um, and I decide, you know, it was a long time away from my family and everything to take kind of like a rest. I can do that yeah. now. And um, But for the next year, I'm starting to give visualizations. I It's a movie um, that is nice, like really, really like it. Here in Canada? No, it will be probably somewhere in the Caribbean. Okay. If I get it, yeah, it will be somewhere in the Caribbean. It's a very interesting director. It's a female director. She did really, really well last year in Sundance. And it's next, her next feature film. Nice. So, fingers, fingers crossed, crossed, I would love to do that one. Um, and then a couple of uh, series here is also, I mean, I don't want to say it, but it's also a, a possibility that I do the next film uh, of a very important director, Canadian director, mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. And then two big um, American series shot in, in here in, in Canada. Okay. So it's that plus Nick, my showrunner from these last two um, two shows, two shows um, has something in the work too, and he it seems like you, you two work together very very nicely. You know what? I think uh, yes, because the trust that we have in each other, I think is is important. He knows that I, like I said, I give my hundred ten percent, and I'm capable of of I understand what he needs and make it 
happening, not only in the matter of the work, but for example, as you can imagine, a friend of the family was a very difficult subject. We're working with yeah. little kids that we couldn't say anything about the project because they don't understand six, eight, and ten yeah. about kidnapping and etc. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. my crew, the reason that I hired the crew that I got, it was because I trust that my crew will be respectful, empathetic. I mean, yeah, because they're working around kids and they need to be sensible about uh, yes. how to be and, around them. And, and I, But not just that, like, again... Treat the like, story in a way that... They didn't know the story. Yeah. That was a difficult part, you know. But you can tell a 10-year-old girl, well, you're going to play a girl that got kidnapped, raped from 10 to 18, Jeez. 16, right? And da-da-da-da-da. Like, no. And you will be surprised. Like, we have um, a psychologist on set, full-time. Wow. And you want to know why? Because this subject brought things in people in the crew. For sure. They they have deal with similarity because they they were abused in a certain way and everything. And it was amazing to see during the process of the of the shooting on a friend of the family how some people start reacting and having difficulties and really like like wow. so nick trust in in my approach he trusts in the person that i am um to choose a team that will be giving us that it was not just another project it was a very specific difficult project and it needed to be taken care of with delicacy and very uh, loving and respectful Right. Yeah. And with the kids, we were not allowed to say anything. For sure. So I didn't want to be like the typical guy. That, hey, what? Well, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. no so comments out of place. I think he trusts that on me, too. Yeah. You know, not just that I can do the job, um, but that I I'm able to whatever he needs in the matter of the team and everything. I'm able to have that and give him that. Mm -hmm. But I work really great with him, and I think he's very young. He's a young showrunner, but as you see, he has his career yeah, is, yeah, has done a lot of stuff, and he's going forward and forward. It's, yeah, that's amazing. and you know, one of the things that I, uh, when I talked to him the first time, he take he told me, and he said, "Sally, I want this project to be the best work I ever done." And when they finished the nine episode in the United States was last week, I wrote him a message and I said, we did it, right? It's the last episode. It is done. I'm so happy. And I wanted to ask you, is this the best work that you ever done? And he said, yes, but thanks to you. Wow. And that is what it makes my... <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can't imagine. Yeah. That's amazing. And that's, that's it. And... I can show you the, the message and they call me the heart of the show. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so thanks for that, that, you, that you're here. Thank and you. And you took the time. I, we, we are over two hours, I think, now. <laughs> it's okay. It's, uh, sorry for that. but No. Did amazing. you have anything else that you wanted to ask Yeah, me? maybe just, I mean, if, if you would give any advice to, I wouldn't say maybe up and coming cinematographers. I mean, I find myself in this situation because I am 28, 27 years old. I'm about to turn 28 and I'm just starting. And I guess a lot of the people that I'm sharing this with um, may find themselves in the same situation. Would you have any advice or anything that you would say? I think um, two things. I think is um, please, please. Not only watch American films, don't watch only American series. There's so much else to see in a different way. We need to open our perception um, of films to a different way, so a different narratives, different languages. Um, I think that's one of the things. Go to museums, see paintings, uh, see photography, Everything that can help you to observe and, and have perception in, in, in light, in framing, and observe, like really, like sit down. It's very difficult. 
if you think that everything you're going to do is in the computer, it's not real, it's not there. You need to feel it. So if it's raining, I'm like I said, very corny. If it's raining, go out and sit down and see the light. What's happening? When you get into a restaurant, how is the lighting? How, where are you in the space? Why is the lighting this way? Why? Ask yourself. Because when you get a project, normally you approach from there, from the memory of a feeling of the space, of a situation or emotion that you had. It doesn't come from the computer. The computer and the movies that you watch is just the, the, the approach. But you need to create your own emotional hard drive. So for any young uh, DP, I will say, yes, S- watch everything that you can that it has a different language. If you haven't seen old cinema, like you know, 60s, 40s from Europe, the different kind of um, movements in cinema that had happened, please watch them because it will change your your point of view just seeing American films. And second is don't get like no for an answer. Like you are capable. Listen, I'm 5'2 and 105 pounds. If I did it, anybody can do it. It's just... Keep the focus, keep the purpose. And, you know, like I told you, to, you know, today, you can make a movie with your iPhone. Mm-hmm. You can even buy the, you know, if you want to do it in anamorphic, you can buy the lenses. <laughs> you <laughs> have no excuse. Yeah. You have no excuse not to do it. But you need to learn how to do it. It's a big difference in between being a videographer and yeah. being a director of photography. For sure. Okay, so don't take no for an answer. Try and shoot. Shoot with your iPhone, with your camera, with whatever you have. Shoot. You will get better as more as you shoot. It is true. Yeah. Talent is really, yes, are people that is gifted. But talent is discipline and work. And if you don't work your eye, you don't work the way you move your body to operate camera, then the talent it doesn't work. So don't take no for an answer. That will be my first. And go and knock as many doors as you can and you will get in if it's really what you need to do, what you want to do. No? And yeah, I think uh, that will be... And create a community if you can. A community of people like you get surround with young people like you that do different things sound find them shoot together write a script because a community is it, film is not made by himself mm. it's not as individual uh, craft it's made by a, by people together with an idea with a dream yeah. and if you find a community with the same dream then you can make it happen that will be my my advice <laughs> I am getting emotional. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real. Thank you so much. It's you're welcome. It's amazing. You're welcome. Um, okay, I just wanna just finish off uh, with something maybe a little fun. <laughs> it's just quick questions that you yeah. can just answer the first thing that comes to your head. Okay. Um, so let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's do it. Okay. See, so if, if it was in cinematography, what other department in film would you would you be working on? If I wasn't a cinematographer, uh-huh. I probably will be an art director. Art director. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Light meter, false color, or eyeballing? Light meter. Light meter? Yeah. Wide open or deep focus? Depends. Okay. Lighting people or lighting spaces? Depends. Okay. <laughs> What's your favorite type of light? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> I can't because... Yeah, no, I, I... Yeah, it depends on the project, for you sure. know, and, and sometimes hard light is beautiful, you know, to create pictures, sometimes... Soft light is the one that you need uh, because of the story or because you have no lights and you have to work with uh, natural lighting. Um, but I think whatever is the light the, the, the I can have is the purpose of that. Why is the purpose of that light? Mm-hmm. Why are you trying to achieve? Why are you trying to tell? That's why. That's why I can tell you, I mean, my favorite light in the world is tungsten. Right. It's tungsten light, right? That's 
It has the best uh, color translation, the softness of the light, the reach of the light. But it's now, in our time, as you probably know, with, I will need three generators. Yeah. If I'm working only with, with toxin light and it's worth it, I'm you know contaminating and all that. So I'm learning you know, to love LEDs. It mm-hmm. took me a long time, I have to be honest, because I didn't... At, when they came for the first time, it was no there good. Now yeah. it's much better. They're evolving a lot now. But tox- tungsten is my love. Like, if I have my choice, <laughs> I really... But it's too... It's, it's not practical anymore. Okay. Unless it's like a period thing that yeah. I need to do. Not practical. I have to, you know, I have to put gels to color correct it instead of just, you mm. know, RGB, yeah. which is a second. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you have a favorite gel? Probably straw. Straw? Mm-hmm. Instead diff- of CTO. Okay. Nice. Mm-hmm. And cyan 30, probably. Nice. Favorite diffusion? Magic cloth. Okay. Um, yeah. And film or digital? Depends. Right. I, I, yeah, I think it depends. Now, these days, depends. Okay. Film is my love, but are, it's now getting very difficult. Um, I wanted to do a friend of the family in film. That yeah. was our pitch, for example. But imagine with three kids, six, eight, and ten, acting, saying, cut to cameras. So mm-hmm. I make the mathematics for that, and I will lose an hour and a half just changing magazines. Yeah. Just changing magazines. Yeah, and kids have a, a, a reduced schedule too, right? Eight hours, they're really translating to three hours, mm-hmm. and then how you're going to make them do it again because I mm-hmm. roll out a film. Yeah. No. So the studio... You know, say no. There's no way. But a film with a different characteristics, yes, I would love to do it again on film. But digital has a lot of, of um, a lot of good things, and I, it's getting better. We're mm-hmm. getting better at it, and and it's just the you know, you and I because we love film, we know and remember how you know film look, and that's how I learned to see. You didn't, but I did, right? Now I very like well, but it looks out of focus. <laughs> It's not out of focus. It's just the way that it used to be, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but all the other people that is not us looking at material, they yeah. will not know. No, I love it. I love that because it depends. It really depends on what you're using it for, right? And it's to serve a purpose and it can of be course. just... Because you could say, oh, well, yeah, I love uh, uh, wide lenses. Not always. Yeah. Not always. And what are you trying to say? What is it about or... You know, uh, well, long lenses. Mm, I like to see the world mm-hmm. around them. I want to feel it. I don't want it to dis- just. Or do I need to take the the character out of the world and feel completely disconnected? Then I use a long lens. So yeah. it's always depends. That's a tough one to ask. Uh, to yeah, no, I, for sure, for sure. But it's it's great. I, thank you. That's you're a welcome. great answer. Thank you so much for doing this. and Thank you for inviting me and the best luck with the podcast. I feel very honored to be the first one, to be honest. Thank, thank you. you. Thank so you for much. being the godmother of this project. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I hope my English is good. No, it's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry for my English. I know it sometimes I say weird things. Don't apologize. Things, Don't apologize. It's, but you're, you're speaking a second language. We are trying thank to you. do this, be ourselves in this in this society. And so, Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And all right. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. <laughs>